The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, alien recipes for meteor sandwiches, ants on a log, uncles too, and long pig. The key to the multiverse is revealed in all its glory. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. So, Christopher, what do we have for everyone this time? Well, this time we have part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and Joel Presby. They are talking about their new entry in the multiverse series, The Road to Hell. This is the world where magic meets steampunk science, the Arcana Sharona universe, following the first two books, Hell's Gate and Hell Hath No Fury. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now, The Road to Hell is um, quite a big book. You've seen it in there. In the... It's a doorstopper, that's for sure. <laughs> it's... That's why we needed two podcast interviews. Yeah, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's complex and wonderful. But it is, man, it is thick with, um, thick with thought and um, action. We'll momentarily talk to David and Joel about that. But first, here's the news. The March mass markets are at booksellers everywhere. These include Into the Maelstrom by David Drake and John Lambshead. This is book two in the Citizen series. This is Dave and John's science fiction recasting of the founding of the American Republic. Plus, there are spaceships that work by pedal power. There are indeed. Um, it's a really cool um, concept of how, uh, how faster than light travel works there. Also out is the very fun alternate prehistory anthology by Tooth and Claw, with stories by S.M. Sterling, Mercedes Lackey, Eric Flint, and Jody Lynn Nye. Particularly really like that Eric Flint novella in there. This is a world where the meteor didn't kill off the dinosaurs, and now the Earth is the realm of intelligent, mind-controlling reptiles fighting a deadly struggle with intelligent, ferocious, evolved cats. So it's basically smart cats versus smart reptiles. They're fighting over the around the edge of the Mediterranean Sea right when it forms. That sounds different. It is. Yeah, I... <laughs> It took me a while to figure out what it was when I first read them. And out in March is Mars, Inc. by Ben Bova. This is Ben's well-considered tale of how a billionaire decides to make an end run around the government and fund a mission to Mars that pays off. Yeah, that's um, that's a very recent book by Ben Bova. We're also putting out the complete short stories of Ben Bova. I set in on that interview. Yeah, Ben is a cool guy. Into the Maelstrom by Tooth and Claw and Mars Incorporated are now out at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and Joel Presby, in which they discuss their new entry in David Weber's multiverse series, The Road to Hell. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome David Weber and Joel Presby to the podcast. Hello, guys, girls, gals. <laughs> hey, uh, hi there. Um, David Weber is the creator of the internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series and the Honorverse, within which that series is set. David has had 29 yeah. New York Times bestsellers, and there are over 8 million David Weber books in print. David is also the author of many other Bane books, including the epic fantasy Bazel series, uh, with Norfraisa series also, we might call it, with latest entry, uh, book one in the new Ken Hoden subseries, Sword of the South. He's the author with Linda Evans of two books in the multiverse series, Hell's Gate and Hell Hath No Fury. And now there's a new entry in the multiverse series, The Road to Hell by David Weber and Joel Presby. Speaking of Joel Presby... Joelle attended the United States Naval Academy. After commissioning, she studied how to find and kill submarines at Naval Postgraduate School and began dating as submarine officers. 
She spent six and a half years active in the Navy and has lived in France, Cameroon, the United States, and Japan. She and her husband, the submarine officer, live in Virginia. Joelle is the officer of Grayson Navy Letters Home, which is an epistolary, epistolary story set in David Weber's Honorverse that appeared on the Bain.com website, an obligated service which was in the Honorverse anthology beginnings. And now she is the co-author of the latest multiverse series entry, The Road to Hell with David. So The Road to Hell takes place in a very complex world. It has a glossary and back, God help, thankfully. It takes place after an initial confrontation and battle between two empires that um, exist in two different universes, Arcana and Sharona. There are mul multiple universes and people can travel between them. How are these multiverse worlds chained together in, in the Hell's Gate sector? And what's so important about that, that area, Hell's Gate? Okay, well... Um... Tell me about the world, in, in other the, words. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's like, where do we begin? Um, yes. The folks the folks in the multiverse don't know exactly how all the, the portals work. They know how to find them. They know how to explore through them. And they know that they are being formed continually, not necessarily at a huge rate of time, but new ones crop up in places where there weren't any before every so often. And you can usually tell how old a portal is because they're very seldom at the same elevation, which means that there's usually a portal wind through them, how the planets are trying to equalize pressures and whatnot. And you can tell from the amount of wind erosion damage and whatnot how long this one's been here. Um, there is, by the way, no reason why one of these portals could not be at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, as far as anyone knows, which could be very interesting at the other end of the portal. Um, <laughs> but um, in the – well, I mean, all that water's got to go somewhere, you know. Um, in the, um, in the um, Hell's, Gate, Hell's Gate situation, Hell's Gate is the biggest portal that anybody has found yet. Um, I don't remember its exact dimensions, but I think it's like close to 30 miles across. And basically, portals, as far as anybody knows, are perfect circles, uh, some of which may be underground from any given universe. You know, they can be in the middle of the mountain. There's like the tracing cut where there's like this little teeny tiny arc at the top of a portal that's obviously buried in the middle of a mountain on one side. And from the other side, you've got this like like 6,000 feet tall, absolutely sheer cliff where it's been cut off by the by the portal from the other universe's perspective. So you can get you can get some really interesting, uh, spectacular scenery going on here. And engineering to get through them can be a little challenging from time to time. In the case of Hell's Gate. Um, it's not only the biggest single portal anyone's found, but there are like six, I think, six or seven secondary portals associated with it, all within a range of like less than 100 miles from each other. And that's never happened anywhere in the exploration of Arcana or Sharona in the multiverse. So it's like, you know, ooh, you know, this is a hugely strategically important nexus of portals. But that's really secondary because Hell's Gate is also the first place that these two civilizations, uh, in Arcana's case, they've been exploring the multiverse for like over 200 years, in Sharona's case for about 80 years. They have never met another human civilization anywhere. Uh, in fact, both of them had largely come to the conclusion that the emergence of humanity was a unique event which had occurred only in their universe. So when they finally do meet each other, both sides have a doctrine of sorts for what's supposed to happen, but it goes awry. And on the one side, on the Arcanan side, exploration is carried out by the military, and on the Sharonan side, it's carried out by civilians. And so there's a clash between the Arcanans and the, the Sharonans. Both of them think the other side shot first. Nobody knows who shot first, including the readers. You're never told who shot first. Um, I guess we did that on purpose. Um, <laughs> and what's really kind of interesting to a lot of readers is the, in the Arcanan culture, all technology is based on magic. All advanced technology is based on magic. On the Sharonan side, you're like Edwardian England, maybe, 
um, with some differences, uh, particularly their, their steam technology is substantially more advanced than Edwardian England's because they've been using it for 80 years to explore the multiverse. I, I got to tell you, the whole reason that this book came to me was the Transtemporal Express. I wanted to do a book where this railroad train, this huge, powerful steam locomotive, comes charging out of this portal from one universe to the other and goes roaring down the rails. <laughs> okay. yeah, so that, is that cool. was what started this whole thing. So there but, is one more difference between Edwardian England and Sharona. Uh, I mean, unless the historians have been keeping great secrets from us, Edwardian England did not have uh, telepaths forming the the basic and how, network of and, their communication how, system. How do you think the British Raj maintained itself? <laughs> well, you, you do have much more um, much more background setting history than I do, David. So if you say that's how it works. No, 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 no. Well, the, <laughs> the, thing that, the thing that I find the most amusing are, the, in a way, is it's the Arcanans who are horrified by the Sharonan technology when they encounter them because the Sharonan rifles and mortars can do things that they can't do with spells. And they haven't realized yet that the Sharonans don't have anything like the spells that Arcana developed at one point that will destroy entire cities. <laughs> okay. mm-hmm. So like, oh my God, look at what they've got, these terror weapons and so forth. And, and the, and the Sharonans, actually is that one Sharonan in says, tell me I'd a lot rather be shot than burned alive. I've tried it both ways. Okay, <laughs> and he has, he has, um, and uh, he's like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take a bullet, you know. Uh, but well, that's before part of what's before going. we get into the culture and everything, I was at, one more thing about the sort of nitty gritty of the metaphysics. So the worlds that are connected by the t- portals are the same world with different mm-hmm. natural laws. Is that correct statement or not? Well, you yeah. have two universes that are connected by a whole bunch of universes that don't have hardly anybody living in them. And one of them, uh, uh, Newtonian physics seemed to work pretty well. And I chose Newtonian with malice aforethought. Um, and in the other, magic works. And they have exactly opposite scientific methods. But they have, the geography um, of, the, of them is... The geography is the same. The well, okay, except for where the portals have rearranged things, and there are there are places that we haven't really dealt with in the books where there have been events unique to individual universes that have caused differences in the terrain. We haven't actually had to deal with one of those yet. But for example, there's no reason why the San Andreas Fault has to let go at the same time in every universe because it's a totally distinct universe. It has a totally different chain of cause and effect. Uh, so there, there are going to be uh, differences, some, some subtle, some not so subtle. Um, but by and large, yes, you have two identical planets, every, both of which have separate, different place names for every freaking feature on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and if the readers think it's hard for them... You should try it for us. You guys at Bain actually reduced the size of the the glossary that appears in the book, and Joel and I are fine with that. But one of the reasons it was as big as it was is that when I put it together, I have to have uh, geographical place name entries, not just for the Arcane and, and the Sharonan features. I have to have one in there for the for the the Our World feature, so that I can look it up and see if it's been named in one of the other universes yet when we get to it. Yeah, but these are so, they're analogous to Earth's features, too, mysteriously. They are. Yeah. Like there's a Pacific well, Ocean. And, and, yeah, and there were some people who were surprised when we, we, we in, this, in the most recent book, the, in Road to Hell, we actually have date entries for the various chapter headings. So you have the, if it's Arcanan characters, you have the Arcanan date, and then you have the Georgian date, for those of us who are not familiar with the Arcanan and Sharonan calendars, so that you know when it is. And there were some people who were very perplexed when they found out that we're back in the 1920s. They're like, 
Why are we back in the 1920s? Well, if we ever get there, you'll find out why we're back <laughs> in the 1920s. Um, you know, it's, it's just uh, unless we get there, you'll never know. You know, and it really shouldn't matter too much because you know it's a whole different universe. <laughs> well, that's a, a Easter there's egg. A that we'll... There's a reason. Yeah. Well, yeah. the extras can be found at bane.com forward slash the road to hell extras, all one phrase. Yes. But there's a pretty substantial glossary in the back anyway. What's that? Yeah, the link, the link, the link to the glossary, like Joel was saying, is also in the book, so that you can find it uh, if you've got a copy of the book. There's no problem finding it to get that extra material. So, we have Sharona and Arcana. We have the Ternathian, I guess you would call it, empire, which is... Um, we call it the Ternathian empire, uh, but that's okay, you know. <laughs> it, it's that's all right. You it's know. ruled by uh, Zindel Chen Kalarath, um, yes. and this is the Sharonan universe, right? And what's so yes. great about yes. having Kalarath as a last name in the Sharonan universe? Well, they've they've been around a while. <laughs> um, well, they have a talent, right? Calorath. Oh, well, the Calorath, um are generally believed, and by the way, it's accurate, to be effectively the sun source of all the tele- uh, the psionic talents of Sharona. In addition to their uh, Edwardian technology. They have uh, uh, telepathic talents that, um, well, the, the, I would say they correspond roughly to the arcane and gifts, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, they're less they, individual, they, they powerful, do. but yeah. They're, um, they're much more mind based, though. Yes, yes. And they're, it's kind of like, you know, the mind boggles at the thought of what would happen if. Um, uh, Gadriel, who is one of our Arcanan characters and who is a magister of the hood, which means she's like, you know, top of the trees, etc. And she teaches combat magics at the Shoma Academy. I don't think a voice would make out real well against Gadriel yes. <laughs> in a consultation. You know, uh, on the other hand, Gadriel wouldn't make out real well if the voice in question had a, uh, a 46 caliber uh, revolver <laughs> in her hand. So, you know, it's kind of a wash. But there's, there are, the, the, the primary difference, really, in a lot of ways, between Sharona and Arcana, is that in Sharona, there's no tech that can't be used by anybody. Okay, there are talents which are sort of to one side of the tech, like the voice talent, which uh, is why uh, uh, Ternathia, as of when we start here, has not developed um, the telegraph or radio. They've never needed it because they've got the voices. Uh, now, they're going to discover that they do need something along those lines for various reasons, but they've been diverted from that whole line of inquiry because of that. However, in Arcana's case, there's a lot of the technology that is totally dependent on people with gifts to charge the, the, the sarcolis crystals that contain the spells. Some of them can only be used by someone who has the gift to use language. So I think, Joel, it, it would be safe to say that uh, our Canaan technology is in many ways more powerful but narrower. Would you say that? Yes, and also the the tendency of an, an already created train to have no trouble driving through a portal, but the difficulty yeah. of spells going through a portal, it, yeah. it really makes one technology much more limited than the other. Yes, well, and it's going to get even worse for the Arcanans when the Sharonans do develop the telegraph, because the Sharonans are going to discover, you know what, you can lay cable through a portal and it will carry the signal just fine. <laughs> Okay, and, and the arcane is going to be, wait, that's another thing they can do we can't do. Um, Somewhere but, in the book, um, uh, you say that 80% of the uh, Sharonans have talents, and only 20% of the um, 
the Arcanans have gifts, but the, the... No, 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 that's not that's not quite accurate. You have roughly the same percentage in both universes that have some ability, either gift or or or, and you have roughly the same percentage in both who are strongly gifted or talented. Okay, uh, the thing is that in the case of an Arcanan. And I don't think we've actually dealt with this specifically in the book. We've actually seen more internally of Sharona than we have of Arcana. We get a much better look inside Arcana in this book than in the previous two, but we've seen yeah. more inside Sharona. Um, one of the things that is not yet been made clear is there are a whole bunch of people in Arcana who are regarded as being non-gifted, but who in fact have very, very weak gifts. A lot of the Garthon, who are the the, the ungifted uh, slave class uh, for our bad guys in Arcana, actually are gifted. But the gift is so low that it doesn't rise to the detectable, trainable threshold. And so they are de facto ungifted. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because the gift is not as strongly differentiated as the talent. The, there, are, there are very specific differences, clusters of talents in, in Sharona, whereas in Arcana, you basically, the difference lies between those who are most strongly gifted working with living material, the magistrons who are healers and who are the dragon breeders and whatnot. <laughs> And the magisters who deal more with the the uh, the non living world, um, uh, and so those that's really the only two divisions on the gift side for all intents and purposes. On the talent side, you've got people who are like portal hounds, which means they can detect portals. You have people who are mineral hounds; they can detect minerals, maybe even a specific mineral. So you have a lot of people in Sharona who have talent but it's not strong enough to rise to the level of someone like one of the great voices like uh, Shalar or um, Alizan uh, Yanimar, the emperor's privy voice. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, equation. And I deliberately set it up to be that way when I was creating the world leaving a certain amount of grayness for me to discover as we went into the books. Um, another part of it, another part yeah. of it is that Arcana is the union of Arcana and has been so since the first portal out of Arcana was, was found in that, that series of unification wars resulted in yeah. them being one entity. Sharona yeah. has done all this exploration without being a united entity. So, well, some nations, even multi-universal nations, might have a pretty good census idea of who has gifts and who doesn't. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of other ones haven't even been intrusive enough to, to make people tell them. Well, and the other thing, though, that's kind of interesting is Arcana has been a unified world multi-universal government for like 205 years, I think. I don't have a copy of the book in front of me, so I can't check the exact name. I think it's like 205 years at the point of this Sounds book. Right. Okay, Ternathia, Sharona, has never been a single united civilization. However, at one point, Ternathia ruled an empire that stretched from Ireland, which is where they started. Sharon wanted Ireland to rule the world, so they did. <laughs> uh, but all the way from there uh, to Mongolia and from the Mediterranean to the Arctic Circle, uh, plus colonizing North and South America. So even though they haven't had, uh, and then and like, I think seven, eight hundred years ago, for reasons that nobody really understands entirely, Ternathia voluntarily pulled back its frontiers. It liberated uh, people who had been subject peoples uh, from 
from Asia all the way back as far as they, Austria is about as far east as their as their empire still stretched as of the beginning of this book. But Ternathia was the gold standard of of of, of Sharona, and you, also the Ternathian Empire has been around for five thousand three hundred years or so. At this point, that's how long ago it it arose. Um, and, um, it actually, the, the calendar dates from the, um, uh, the, um, year in which the very first gifted Ternathian emperor, uh, took power and the see, Ternathia carried the gifts with them as they colonized. That was one reason, uh, not colonized, that was more like expanded that, Trust me, there's a long, complex history that I put together of how this process works and how they got to where they were. As they accepted uh, subordinate states. How about yeah. that? Yeah, that, yeah, and that's fair. That's fair. Uh, basically, Ternathia never set out to conquer the world. It was just there was always something unpleasant going on at the frontiers. And so the army would, would move in and say, okay, look, you guys cool it, you know, and eventually they'd wind up with another the province. The Calirats all have the glimpse talent. No, no, they don't. Not all of them. No, they don't. Um, oh, okay. It would be no. It would be fairer to say that only Calaras have the glimpse. Ah, I see. Okay, um, and um, it hasn't been absolutely specified that you must have the Calaras talent to be emperor or empress. And in fact, you can without the glimpse. It's very, very rare. Um, and the glimpse is probably in a lot of ways both the most ambiguous and the most powerful of all the talents that we've revealed so far. Would you agree with that, Joa? I would. I would. Yeah. Um, essentially, what the glimpse is, they, they have precogs, people who, who have precognition in Sharona, and they're like weather forecasters and whatnot, but they can only see a limited distance and what they see tends to be more related to um, non-sentient uh, uh, events. Okay, like, for example, precogs can't sit there and tell you six days out how the election is going to come out. Okay, but they can tell you what the weather is going to be like on election day. You see the distinction? Okay, the Calarath glimpse actually deals specifically with the interactions of humans. And with a Calarath may realize something like, for example, uh, the, the eruption of Krakatoa. But they realize it because of the impact it had on the human beings in their glimpse, rather than their seeing the eruption and watching what happens to the people. You see the distinction that I'm making? And for, for a dynasty, this is a huge advantage. The problem is that glimpses are almost always fragmentary. And they usually don't come with something that helps you set the temporal context, except very generally. Um, there's also the problem that, like, for example, in Hell Hath No Fury, Crown Prince Janaki, um, Emperor Zindel's son, um, and um, Andrin, Andrin Kalarath's older brother, has the glimpse talent. And he realizes that he needs to use it to defend uh, a position that's about to be attacked by Arcana. But he also knows that if he stays, he will die. And he doesn't tell anybody because he knows they would order him out. He tells one person indirectly, um, and that is um, the general of the 4th Dragoon Division, which is headed in his direction, and who has the seniority to order him out, except that Janaki unloads the uh, uh, statement of responsibility of the Kalarat dynasty on him, and he realizes he can't order him out. Um, and the reason that Janaki knows that he's going to die if he stays is he's having what they call a death glimpse. And this is the only glimpse that someone can have that affects them directly. That's one of the limitations of the glimpse. Um, and Janaki's talent is not strong enough for him to be moving simultaneously. He's got to be at the focal point of what he's glimpsing to glimpse it at all. 
and so he has to stay where he knows he'll die if he stays there. His sister Andrin is much more powerfully uh, uh, talented than he is, and there have been Calares. You see, actually, an example of this in Road to Hell, who can enter what they call fugue state. Um, and be in the middle of a glimpse and still be fully capable of movement, of combat, of everything else. And I got to tell you that the notion of someone who in hand-to-hand combat can see exactly what his opponent's going to do before his opponent does it, he has a teeny tiny advantage. Just, uh, just a very small one. Just a small one, you know. Uh, but there's a, scene, there's a scene in which... Um, Zindel's bodyguards are trying to grab him to save him from from a danger that he is determined for reasons that make sense in the book that he has to court, even though he's almost certainly going to die. And he's he's this big, huge guy. Okay, he's like seven feet tall. Seriously, um, and the Calaras are all tall, um, which is not real Irish, but <laughs> yeah, what the heck? Uh, they've been intermarried with Scandinavians for like. 5,000 years. But anyway, um, this big, great big guy and the bodyguards are trying to grab him and he's just not there when they reach for him. He knows exactly, you know, if I turn my shoulder three quarters of an inch, his hand will slide off and he won't be able to grab me. Okay. Um, And that scene is in there in part because it illustrates what the talent can do and it's also setting up something that someone else may do in a later book possibly could be my <laughs> if, if you know the readers like this book and have interest in future books in the series content well i have to i have to say okay i i really enjoyed working with linda when we did the first two books and working with joe it's like every collaboration you it's it's different because you're working with a different writer and they have different strengths they have different approaches to things mm-hmm. um this book was very exhausting to me, but none of the exhaustion had anything at all to do with Joel. Joel did yeoman work uh, on this on this book. Uh, it was I huge help. I hate to now, say that, everyone. Yes, yes, that's okay. You know, I'll, I'll take cash. Okay. Uh, all right. But, but the um, the now there were we as like Joel said the other day. We maxed out the ability to make comments using the review function in Word. Did you know that there's a top limit on how many comments and words you can have? We found it. And then there's, <laughs> and then there's also a limit on how many characters that you can put inside an individual comment. We found that too. Yes, yes, yes. But, well, yeah, it's like twice I just finally said, all right, accept all comments. <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> um, and, and, and went back and started over again because – we had, we had pushed so much stuff back and forth. And part of it was that Joelle was coming at it cold. This was all new material to her. Mm-hmm. Part of it was that I was coming at it after an eight, nine-year hiatus. Um, part of it was that we were hammering out plot concepts while we were doing it. And part of it was that this is Joelle's first novel. Um, and the fact that we could do this, um, thank God for the Internet, um, it, it, uh, I would say that pre-internet, putting this book together between the two of us would have been at least a two-year project. Would you say that? Would have been more painful. Well? Much more painful. Yeah, but I'm, I'm serious. With the number of comments that we sent back and forth and, to each other? Yeah. If we had to mail it instead of just yeah. you know, write back and forth? Yeah. yeah. Those, those photons pack, you know, they pack tight. You know, you can... What was your process in writing this? That... Um, all right. Uh, let me let me lay out how I think it worked, okay. and then we'll let Joel lay out. You know, correct me. Um, essentially, the universe was already built, but like any literary universe that's been built, before you write the novel, you haven't painted the walls, you haven't chosen the color of the carpet. You know, you've got the structure. And there's a lot of stuff, a lot of texture that's going to fill in, that's going to reflect the writer who did the filling in. Okay. Um, and essentially, I did the military components of this, um, the, uh, the Arcanan, the, the, the Ternathian strategy, how they moved, how it's fought, you know, et cetera. 
And I would say that I did the logistics side of it. Um, and Joel did a lot of going back and taking some elements that Linda and I had already done that needed to be modified in light of how they, the first two books had modified them and fusing that with entirely new material uh, to build, uh, for example, I think the cetaceans uh, are entirely her creation. Um, and um, I told her the other day, I got an email from somebody who said he'd been waiting like eight years for the book, and, and he was so happy that it finally came out, and the cetaceans were his favorite part of the entire book. Um, and, um, well, and, 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 and that's because they're very well done. Okay, they're very well done. Um, well, I didn't but, feel like I'd created the citations entirely because they are they are mentioned in in the first book. It's just yes. that they they were they were some of my I I imagined a lot more than what was actually on the page of those first two books when I was reading them for the first yes. time. And so I really yes. wanted to give them more scenes. And so mm-hmm. that was a great part of actually being part of writing this now. Well, and that's what I meant in part by saying that, you know, the universe is built, but the inter- it's basically you've got the frame, you've got the roof, you've got the walls, the exterior walls. But, you know, you can do a whole lot to change a house around just by, well, do we do wood paneling in the, in, in the great room or, you know, st- uh, if we're going to do a, a flagstone floor, you know, what stone <laughs> do we use? What's, your, what's the color? Um, and and that's a huge, huge part of making a novel work when the kind of, of tapestry of multiple worlds that are the same world. You've got to have that texture, that sense of, of, of a differ, because if they don't, you don't have the authenticity of the, of the, two, the two totally separate society. I actually had somebody tell me that he thought, oh, these are the two, you know, best, most fully developed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. What I think we have done successfully is to create the feel that they are fully detailed. And we can continue to expand on those details as we go along. So what we have is, um, for want of a better term, we have an expanding frame to work with rather than one where we painted ourselves in by thinking too small when we started out. At the same time, there are limitations deliberately built into what they can and can't do to hold down the tendency to develop God weapons when we decide we need them. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I found out in the Honor Harrington's and in the, in the Dahat books that giving yourself those limits, building them in hard and fast from the very beginning helps a lot um, in the quality of the writing and the amount of thought you have to put into, well, how are they going to make this work? How are they going to solve this problem? Um, well, it's, but, a, um, it's a heroic amount of world building, I'll have to say. Have, I mean... Whether it's a uh, part suggesting a whole or not, there's a hell of a lot of parts. <laughs> well, you can blame Amy McCaffrey for that a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hadn't realized um, until maybe four or five years before Annie's death, and I'm glad that I got her told, that um, one of the things that turned me into a world builder was her Pern novels. Because that was the first set of books that I read in which I said, you know what, by God, there's an entire world behind this. Where I had that feeling, where I made that connection. I'm not saying she was the first person to do it. I'm saying that was where I made the connection. And I was already doing a lot of um, uh, role-playing games, D&D and that kind of thing. And they always made me be the the GM. Uh, So I was doing a lot of world-building there, too. And I'm a historian by training. So for me, this is kind of a, 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 I enjoy doing it. Um, And I enjoy pushing things around. Okay, for example, in in Arcana, the nasty racists are all from Africa. The militaristic uh, uh, aristocratic guys are from North America. 
and the frothing at the mouth, dangerous radical Democrats, you know, et cetera, are all from China and Asia. Okay. And I have to tell you that playing around with that kind of a, ooh, <laughs> that's just so wrong, you know, kind of thing. Uh, you know, I, uh, the the um, Andarans in Arcana came out of North America, but they're basically Prussia. There's actually a point. Well, it's, that's how I think of them. There's actually a point in here at some point where somebody says, you know, they're they're uh, a uh, uh, an army which somehow acquired a country, which has of course been said about about Prussia and Germany. I don't really think of them as Prussian Prussians, if you know what I'm saying, but they have a lot of that uh, that flavor to them. And in Sharona, obviously, you know, we have these these uh, these Irishmen who are like six, seven feet tall, who 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 rule the world. Um, it's uh, well, going back for a minute. Matter, we were talking about uh, the Calabrats and everything else. When Sharona realizes that it's up against a multi-universal threat, and it begins with. Uh, their entire survey party being massacred by the Arcanans. Um, you, we, we talked about the talents. We talked about the voices. Um, voices are able to transmit messages and also what they see, what they hear. They can, they can basically take their own experience and make it that of anyone else who has the telepathic ability to receive their voice reports. So in the middle of this, this incredible firefight that breaks out in Hell's Gate, where you've got like an entire platoon of Arcanans on one side, 10, 15 Sharonans on the other, and it's magazine rifles versus fireballs, you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, the voice in the Sharonan party is a young woman named Shalar, who is very strongly talented, and she manages to hold her voice link to the person who's receiving her report while all her friends are being killed around her, while she's burning her maps so they can't follow her back, while her husband is being hit by a fireball and burned alive in front of her, and then all of a sudden the link goes dead. Now, you have to understand that this is what hits a telepathic civilization when the report comes in. And that's what the entire universe of Sharona is reacting to. Um, and and Darcel Kinlapia is is the one who is the voice who first receives that that yes. message live from Shalar. And he's an important character later in this in this book, The Road to Hell. Oh, he definitely is. And he has he he loved Shalar. Okay, she was married, and she to one of his friends. The whole thing. So there was nothing. He wasn't going anywhere with it that he shouldn't have gone or anything else. But he realizes when she's dead how much he loved her, um, and this is a huge, huge uh, psychic blow to him. But when this word gets home, everybody in Sharona says, "Oh, we better organize." Well, there's really only one outfit on Sharona that most of the planet is willing to accept as the new governing authority for an entire planetary empire or, or state. And that's the Ternathian Empire. Um, and so Zindel is basically in a position to become the emperor, not just of Ternathia, but of all of Sharona, except, of course, for Chava Busar and the um who are... In, in all caps, not nice people. Um, and so, you know, one thing that's going on in both these universes, there's a lot of skullduggery going on behind the scenes. The difference is that the Sharonans are aware of it from the beginning on their side. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, you can't trust Java Busar in the dark, you know, kind of thing. It's, <laughs> it's the, the nature, nature of a telepathic of, society that they're going to know. Yeah. Can you can you all set what? up sort of the opening? So Andrin is in a pickle at the very beginning, right? Andrin uh, Calirath, or seemingly yeah, in a pickle. Up. Yes. Well, okay. The the articles of of unification to create the Sharonian Empire um, originally required Janaki to marry a princess of Yaramatha to to merge the two most powerful dynasties 
into into the new ruling house. Well, Janaki gets killed. And so Chabadusar initially starts out, well, we have to go back and rethink all this because he's hoping to get a better position. He's really not a nice person. Um, and Andrin, at the end of the second book, the one before this one, basically stands up and and it's amazing that Chaba didn't get incinerated on the spot when she unloads on him. She's only 17. Um, but she says more or less, you know, excuse me, there is still an heir to the throne of Ternathia, and the heir to the throne of Ternathia is still prepared to marry a Euromathian as the accords require. But none of his sons are really great, trust me. You know, like her bodyguards are thinking, okay, we're going to have to post somebody in the royal bedchamber to protect the the you know, to protect her from her consort kind of thing, um, and that's the pickle that she's in, and that her father is. I will say that Zindel is even more devastated by the possibility than he ought to have been. Uh, looking at what's going to happen. I mean, he's looking at a daughter who is probably going to be committed to, a, a, at the very best, a loveless marriage, probably one with a husband who is a real piece of work. But she's also going to be empress of Sharona, okay? And with bodyguards galore, this consort can be as rotten a person as he wants, Okay, but his ability to truly brutalize her and so forth, the way that Zendel is afraid will happen, um, is is it's much less than Zendel is thinking. But the problem, what what's going on in Zendel's head is he's just lost his son, and now his daughter is heading into this mess, and he's had some glimpses of her future and knows some bad things are going to happen. And so all of this is coming together on him as the father who cannot protect his children. And so, and who, who has to, in effect, give his children to his family's uh, destiny. Um, and by the way, it turns out in the course of the book that he really does have to give them to the destiny of the Calarath dynasty. Um, and he's in really two or three minds about that, but he doesn't have a whole lot of choice. The, the Calaraths have been around for as long as they have for reasons, which I think, Joe, would you say they begin to become evident in this book? Uh, yeah, I, I think they're, they're beginning to become evident, not just that they've been around, that they, that so many of them have been good emperors instead of just. And, and, and why? Who happen why? to be the, the kid of someone. And, and yeah. why they have, why they stay that way. And yeah. that there is so little corruption going on. Yeah, there, there, there is an actual reason why the Calarath dynasty, the Calarath dynasty is incredibly venerated in Sharona by everybody but Chava Busar and the Seneschal. <laughs> okay, here's a piece of work. Uh, but um, the, 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 the Calarath motto is, I stand between. Um, and they stand between their subjects and their enemies. They stand between their people and death. They stand between the light and the dark. That's what they've done for 5,000 years. Some of them have done it better than others, but a lot of them have died doing it. There's, um, um, there's a very famous um, um, uh, Ternathian emperor. Pally, uh, I think you're thinking. Pally, yes. Yes, and, and it's like there's this ancient, ancient piece of Ternathian that is like archaic language, and it's Shawarik, and it means, uh, I am your son. And it's like when Janaki knows that he's going to die if he stays behind, the message that he sends to the general, the only general, the only person who really has an inkling he's going to die if he stays, ends with him looking straight you know, saying basically, Shawarak Halian, you know, I am your son, I remember. that, And the reason for this is that Halian had a glimpse and knew he and his army would be destroyed if they stayed to fight as they were obligated to do under their alliance to save one of the Bolakine uh, city-states. They're like in um, uh, northwest Africa. 
Um, and he stayed anyway, and he's buried at the gates of the of the city state that he stayed to defend. And so, basically, if a Calarath tells you on you know in the name of his house, yes, we will stay and fight with you to the end. Then you know that that means that he'll be there when the last bullet is fired and the last body falls, however it comes out. And they've spent five thousand years paying cash to build that kind of a of an attitude. Um, and the the uh, the Arcanans really don't have anybody like that. They've got some folks like the Duke of Garshoma, who is this. Uh, um, kind of the byword for Andaran honor, okay, who is, I think, comparable to a Calarath. But even the Andarans don't have anything to compare to this 5,000-year-old dynasty that has occasionally screwed up. There have been a couple of emperors who turned out to not be great prizes. There have also been a couple of emperors, even though we haven't covered this, who had accidents, um, because their own bodyguards removed them um, because of something. A Calarath's not immune against going insane, for example. So even if they are bound to determine to be the best emperor they possibly can when they take the throne, that doesn't mean something's not going to happen that's going to, to impair them. And if the impairment gets too bad, uh, they'll either abdicate, which they won't have a choice about doing, um, literally, they won't have a choice. It's not a legal matter, but they won't have a choice. Or, in a couple of cases, they have actually been assassinated by their own bodyguards um, because they had something had obviously gone wrong, if you see what I'm saying. Shades of but the I, later I, Roman I, Empire. I, yeah, well, no, they've never had they've never had anybody like a Nero, trust me, uh, because <laughs> it, it, it could never get that far, uh, or Caligula, okay? I mean, these guys are, it's interesting, and there's a, there's a, a passage in the book where Zindel is, is basically, oh, man, he's so pissed with his very first uh, gifted ancestor. Uh, because the reason that the that the the House of Calarath has been so true to this vision and so forth is that he bound them to it five thousand years ago, and they've been pretty much stuck with it. It's part of the the coronation ceremony, and there are some people, at least one that we see in the book, who are sort of offended when. Uh, one of the things that Zindel insists upon is that if he's going to have the crown of Sharona, they have to use the same coronation ceremony that Ternathi has been using for 5,000 years. And they're like, talk about arrogant. You know, they're not even going to allow anybody else into this, etc. Well, the reason is that Zindel has very consciously now bound his dynasty to have the same responsibility for the, the entire flipping planet and every universe associated to it that his family was already carrying in Ternathia. That was part one of a two-part interview with David Weber and Joel Presby on The Road to Hell. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. This is confusing, Hoot said, looking at the electrical panel. 
confused the shit out of me the first time I looked at it, Faith said, throwing a breaker back and forth. But this isn't complicated. The large, the Vicky, that freaking alpha, those are complicated. She hit the start button and the engine started whining. Come on, baby. The engine rumbled to life and she grinned. And we have a working boat, Faith said. I think we get some sort of spiff for that, but I don't really know what it is. Spiff? Hooch said. Bonus, Faith said. Like extra rations or booze or something. Speaking of which, she keyed her radio. You want the good pickings? Come and get them. And it works. Awesome, Sophia replied. Maybe I'll ask for an upgrade. Might want to look at the master cabin before you say that. Oh my God, the man said, his face white. I know, zombies, right? Faith said to the captain of the prize crew. The group was made up of recent rescuees, mostly from life rafts, who had volunteered to join the flotilla. They're worse than a rock band. Just try to avoid the crap. The flying bridge isn't too bad, and it's a nice clear day. All you've got to do is run it into Bermuda. The course is laid in on the GPS. Just follow the marked route. That's the current channels, whatever the markers might say. Don't necessarily follow the markers. They're getting filled up. Follow the marked route, got it? Yeah, the man said. If you get into trouble, we're always up on 16, Faith said. Don't go into the lower decks unless you've got a really strong stomach. The marine with me puked. Put it that way. Who cleans these up? The guy asked, looking at the feces and blood-smeared interior. First test of a captain in the flotilla, Faith said, grinning. Can you find a crew who's willing to clean the boat? You drink, Hooch? Sophia asked. There's two reasons for my nickname, Hooch said. 25-year-old Strathisla, Sophia said, handing him a highball half full of dark whiskey. One of the real reasons to be a clearing boat. And stuff like this, Faith said, admiring the new gold and diamond tennis bracelet on her wrist. She'd had to extend it with a bit of parachute cord, since it was for a much smaller wrist. Especially since I don't drink. This is authorized? Hooch asked, taking a sip of the scotch. I'm not really into scotch, but that's pretty good. And enough of it, and you forget what you see, Sophia said, taking a pull. Balancing doing this job half-hammered and just doing it is the tough part. And we are authorized one-third of the salvage from cleared boats as the clearance boat. We really don't have the room for it. Basically, we can take anything we can carry. Hell, you don't even clear, Faith said. What do you see that's so bad? And I don't drink. Remember that raft with the kids in it, Faith? Sophia asked, taking another drink. Yeah. Faith said, looking at the deck. Kids? Hooch asked. Life raft, Sophia said. Two kids. Maybe six and eight. Zombies? Hooch asked. No, Faith said. That was the tough part. They hadn't zombied. There was no saltwater still. I mean, there was a pack for one, Sophia said. It had been opened, but the still was gone. Maybe they could read the directions, set it up, but didn't hook it up right, and it drifted away. But it was gone. They died of dehydration. Oh, crap, Hooch said. That one, still, Faith said, her face working. I mean, they must have tried really hard. They at least got the still out, you know? Empty rafts, Sophia said. What happened? Who knows? Rafts with zombies and bits of the rest of the crew. Lifeboats with corpses and one zombie. Or even that's dead. Just putrid bits of meat and intestines all over the fucking place. She took another hit of the scotch and breathed it through her nose. So I'm 15 and I'm shooting for cirrhosis of the liver by 30. Sue me. We earned this. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com 
to Christopher Rocchio. Thank you, Christopher. No problem, Tony. Thanks to, for having me. Sure. To Rachel Mintel, Connor Small, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a portal to a universe where Dodge City is the railhead for drives of neon unicorns across the Great Plains and is now called Sparkle Pony Junction. Plus a bound facci of shafts of sunlight, thanks and praise to David Weber and Joel Presby, authors of The Road to Hell. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And what do we say, Christopher? And keep reaching for the stars. The Bane Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. (laughs) 